Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's all Bly herself, Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria, she's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the Queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, Thebes. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. Well, a woman a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, because that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great. I'm just gonna lay down. <laughs> Number seven, Empress Theodora. Theodora from the brothel, as she's often known as. I don't know why, but here we are. From actress to marrying Emperor Justinian I, Empress Theodora had quite the life. The two ruled together during the golden period of the Byzantine Empire. She was the most powerful woman ever seen in Byzantium, just like her mother Theodora was born into the theater and would travel performing acrobatics, dancing, and stripping while also working as a Lady of the Night because the kind of the two went hand in hand. She was said to have danced a particularly lurid routine with geese. Don't let your imagination run too far with that one. So how did she marry an emperor? Well, there was a tradition in the Byzantine court for emperors to marry beauty contest winners. Entrants could be from any class. But Justinian still had to amend that law that stated he couldn't marry an actress to make it happen. But she was the most beautiful, so you know, do it up. 20 years his junior, Justinian ensured she was crowned as his equal. As they were matched in intelligence, ambition, and energy, the two heralded in a new era for the Byzantine Empire. Number six, Cleopatra. Cleopatra had some wild methods herself to get attention, you know, believing she was the goddess Isis. She tried to appear as the goddess as often as she could. So she would do so by preparing these dazzling entrances everywhere she went. She would also look fabulous. She's known as like the most beautiful queen ever for this reason. The most famous entrance she made was in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria. This was an important time in ancient Egypt. There were problems with the family. She was banished at this time, but she still wanted to meet the Roman general Caesar. Hmm, how do you meet the man nicknamed the bald adulterer without being seen? Well, she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack like a bowling ball and then personally hand delivered right to Caesar's bedroom. DoorDash. The king. See ya. I'm gonna sneak into concerts by using this method, see if it actually works. So she won the heart of Rome's future dictator. Great. And then eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Quite the play, if you ask me. Now, her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance. And in a following battle, he drowned in the Nile, leading to Cleopatra's ultimate return to the throne. All you gotta do is take your clothes off and jump in a sack. See ya. Number five, Nell Gwynn. 
Good old pretty witty Nell Gwynn, perhaps one of, if not the most famous actress to ever take up the stages of old. Women were not allowed to perform in theaters until King Charles II took up the throne after Cromwell banned theater altogether because he was the worst. To bring back some spice to the world, not only did he bring back theater, he brought women to the stage because seeing them dressed up as men was kind of hot because they had wore tights. Anyways, enter Nell Gwynn, who would later become his mistress. She started out as an orange seller in his theaters. Very very often synonymous with being a lady of the night, but her natural wit and charm caught the eye of an actor named Charles Hart. She soon became his lover, but she soon joined the troupe as a comedic actress. She had a series of lovers before King Charles became enamored with her among his other love affairs. The guy was busy. She wasn't greedy, but Charles couldn't help but spoil her. She never received a title, but after calling their son a right in front of them and she was like what else am I supposed to call him? Their son became the Duke of St. Albans. The public adored her and was the only royal mistress in history to provoke public adoration. Once while she was in a coach, the public thought she was the Duchess of Portsmouth. Instead, she stuck her head out the window and said, pray good people be civil, I'm the Protestant Good for you, Nell. She died sadly just past her 30s, likely due to the lead makeup she wore. She survived the king by just two years, and when he died, he said, please take care of Nell Gwynn, because she's the cutest. Number four, Marilyn Monroe. We've all heard her name, but do we even know why? Who was Marilyn Monroe? Real name, Norma Jean. She was an actor in LA who over time became a sex symbol. She was in numerous blockbusters around the 50s, and to this day, she's still an icon. Her fame, of course, meant unwanted attention at times. Most times. Like so many celebrities now, her private life was the center of attention, and it was quite a lot to deal with alone, I'm sure, let alone the entire world watching you and judging you. The rumors going around about her and John F. Kennedy and how she was having an affair, and then she divorced her third husband right after that happened, and then just at age 36, she was found next to a bottle of Nambudal pills, which were sleeping pills. Following a celebrity's life can be pretty harmful, especially when you hold them up to this standard because they're famous or they're good looking. It's toxic. If Marilyn Monroe was alive today and this all happened, Happen now, it would probably be even worse because now we have bored people on TikTok. So she'd probably have a worse time. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough, sure, but Mary Ann Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson, and then it happened. That's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husbands and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time, like 50 years ahead of her time. That's that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And, well, it's also it's also like cold-blooded, cl calculated. Unaliving, you know, but but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, mm, yeah, see that dog? The dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Marianne Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair. That's good. Don't let her cook. Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London. Ooh, baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer, which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom-related sicknesses were at an all-time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kind of just went for it. Raw, is something wrong with you, love? 
I don't care, let's go anyway. Number 10, Julie Dobigny. A sword wielding opera singer? Uh, yes, sign me up please. I am so here for this. There is so much to unpack about this story. So she was born the daughter of the secretary of King Louis XIV's master of horse. She moved to the court of Versailles in 1682. Her father was an expert swordsman and educated her alongside the boys he taught because she was his only kid. She even dressed as a boy and excelled at the sport. She ran off with a fencing master and toured, showing off her skills to wide audiences. One audience member, however, couldn't believe she was a woman because she was so good, so she flashed the crowd, who responded with complete stunned silence. She began singing at the Marseille Opera where she met her first love, a young woman. This woman though was packed off to a convent by her family and Julie followed to help her escape. They burned down the convent and ran off together and she was actually sentenced to death by the parliament, but Julie would continue to live on one adventure after the next. She would later be pardoned by parliament and continued to go on to become an opera star and had many other lovers. Number 9, Betty Page. If you're a fan of pinup art, then you almost have to be a fan of the one, the only, Betty Page. She is the one who defined the art form. Page was an American pinup icon who scandalized society with her risque and alternative kink modeling photos. We can thank her for the bikini, as it was Page herself who made it popular. Pop stars to this very day model themselves after her, her iconic haircut being found on stars such as Katy Perry and Dita Von Teese, her poses in her famous Famous photos were found in music videos such as like, it's just, it's, she had a massive amount of influence. She redefined a sexually repressed era with her free spirit and unabashed presentation of her sexuality, but she was taken advantage of a lot of the time. Betty actually didn't make any royalties after her prince until Hugh Hefner got her an agent. But by the end of the 1950s, Betty walked away after a nervous breakdown and retired as a born again Christian. There was a lot of suffering that Betty didn't show to the world or even admit to herself. Sadly, the woman whose face everyone knew was diagnosed with schizophrenia due to severe trauma from her childhood. For years, no one knew if she had even passed away, but people were still obsessed with her until she was finally tracked down for a documentary. She refused to take any photos, but would give interviews over the phone. She finally hired a lawyer to try and recoup some of the money she lost for her image and spent her final days living with her brother in LA. Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she she really put in a lot of work. Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I really, I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comment section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to make some cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards. But that's okay because no matter how well Typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always going to make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderland, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy. Anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided and twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. However, some were still not pleased, a one John Wilkes Booth to be specific. 
had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Nazi, Nazi, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> Oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, no, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene, and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which, given how women were treated back in the day, is kind of strange because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do, and women who are for sure guilty get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened and then she walked to the house and what? Mom and Dad, what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody my bloody shorts here. What? Who did that? What? That's crazy. Number three, Mae West. I see a man in your life. One, only one. Mae West, as sassy as she was on screen, she was even more so off of it. Her wisecracking, quippy sensuality became a sensation people couldn't get enough of. West started out in vaudeville and Broadway before she hit the big screen, singing and doing acrobatics. By 1926, Mae began to write and produce her own plays, the first being titled Sex. Her performance was of a woman of the night and you can imagine the stir she caused. It also earned her an 8 day jail sentence for corrupting the morals of youth. She loved to ridicule social attitudes towards sexuality, which became a part of her trademark style. She was also a big supporter of the gay community, even writing a play called Drag as a celebration of drag in New York City, on top of it being a living room comedy. As you can guess, this also stirred up some serious controversy. But despite it all, Wes seemed to enjoy the reaction of the private and reserved public, loving every minute that it made her famous. Number two, Marsha P. Johnson. Marsha P. Johnson is most famously known for her work to help support the LGBT LGBTQ plus movement in New York City for nearly 25 years. Marsha played a key role in the Stonewall riots that found the gay pride movement today. She was a drag performer and black trans woman who did everything she could to advocate for trans youth, homeless people, and people living through the AIDS epidemic. She even used money she earned as a night worker to help fund a refugee for homeless people. Along with fellow activist Sylvia Rivera, she founded STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, which created a safe place for homeless trans youth to sleep and feel safe. It was the first LGBT LGBTQ plus shelter in North America. Sadly, however, Johnson never got to see how far the movement would take the world as she died in 1992. Her body was found in the Hudson River and it was ruled that she took her own life. However, many suspect foul play as her case was never actually investigated, they just assumed. Many activists believe today that someone had indeed taken her life. Marsha P. Johnson danced, performed, and rioted her way to making the public listen to the voices people were afraid to hear and her legacy lives on today. And last but not least, Rosa Parks. One of the loudest scandals in history that ferried in waves of change was the decision Rosa Parks made one day to stay seated on a bus. It was a scandal that transformed the world. In 1955, Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white man from Montgomery, Alabama. This simple and brave refusal initiated the civil rights movement in the United States. Her actions inspired the Montgomery bus boycott, led by a young Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Up until this point, bus segregation was enforced, and the black community was forced to sit in the back of the bus always. It was also customary for bus drivers to request that black citizens give up their seat to white citizens. So one day when Parks was riding home from work, she was exhausted, the bus driver asked part of the back of the bus to stand to make room for a white citizen. Parks was the only one who refused and she was arrested as a result. In her autobiography, Parks writes, and I quote, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically, no. The only tired I was was tired of giving in. Kicking off the list at number 10, Madame de Pompadour. One of the most powerful women in the 18th century, France, Madame de Pompadour is known mainly as the mistress of King Louis XV of France. The last ever portrait of her shows us a respectable middle-aged woman piercing through your skull. 
or your soul. I don't know why I said skull, it's pretty intense, but we'll keep it right through your skull, apparently. Since her birth in 1721, she was well educated and quickly she became a member of the French court. She is remembered mainly as the official chief mistress of King Louis XV from 1745 to 1751. But in 1756, she was officially named the 13th lady in waiting. That's a pretty big deal. Over her lifetime, she became the political advisor to the king, which many historians aren't too fond of. But to be fair, she put in the work to get his attention. She would show up to his place in a carriage at night. She would put on plays, like actual productions where she was the lead. I don't know why I did Peter Pan, but hey, that's how I do it. She would perform plays about nymphs and the gods. So if that doesn't deserve a super like, I'm not really sure what does. Number nine, Veronica Franco. Born of a merchant man and his wife, a courtesan, Veronica was destined for a movie worthy life. Franco lived in the 1500s and her father ensured that she was equipped with a strong education. She quickly found a love for reading and writing, her poetry becoming part of her legacy later on. Sadly though, her beloved father died very suddenly, leaving her family close to ruin. And so, her mother stepped in to give her a different sort of education. She was an excellent student. And though she married a much older doctor when she was just 16 years old, she was later unfaithful with a merchant dissolving the marriage entirely. She then became known as an honest courtesan, meaning she was highly educated and could fraternize with important and dignified personnel of the time. She had a short affair with King Henry III of France. She also continued her writing pursuits and was even accepted in one of the most well known literary circles in Venice, and two of her volumes were published. This is in the 1500s, keep in mind, that's, that's incredibly rare. As a sexually free and intellectual woman, she would have made quite the stir. Sadly, she died penniless at 45 after she lost all of her wealth in the plague. But she is forever immortalized for her poetry and her philanthropy in helping old and destitute courtesans. Prior to the plague, she planned to build a safe house for them. Number eight, Mata Hari. Birth name Margarita Zell, this scandalous figure in history, was an exotic dancer with a tragic past turned. Super spy. At age 27, Mata moved to Paris and reinvented herself as an artiste. As most do at that age and that time of their life, she tapped into her Dutch roots and started to perform these dance acts under the alias Lady Gresha McLeod. She was the first dancer, check this out, the first dancer to go fully nude. Her shows, of course, got busy. People were into this new found idea. She was the talk of the town, many towns for that matter. And eventually she got so good she started to tour. Yeah, like Green Day, she would tour all around. For years she would travel around Europe and perform these sold out crowds, but the most intriguing part was her clientele. These military officers and aristocrats would give her gifts after these shows. They wanted to hang out, of course. They were in love after a performance like that. Mata was on board, she loved this. Especially coming from a tragic, horrible marriage previously, this was the life that she needed. So around 1914, her dancing days were starting to decline. Those patellas were starting to catch up to her. Plus the war also broke out and things changed. Hari ended up being sent back to Holland and was later approached by Karl Kromer, German council in Amsterdam, because the men she was in contact with were considered a valuable asset at this time. So she went from being a dancer to a spy, codename H21. That's so sick. James Bond who? Number seven, Mary Laveau. Mary Laveau is an absolute legend in practice and by lore. Her mysterious past and practices made her the absolute talk of the town. She was the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Voodoo or voodoo is a combination of West African religions brought over to the Americas through the slave trade. It then blended with Christianity and the traditions of indigenous peoples. Marie was the first generation of her family to be born free. But due to laws and practices of the time, Marie and her husband bought and sold around eight slaves in their life. Time, though it was also believed that she aided in the escape of slaves as well. But what she is most famous for is her work as a voodoo queen in New Orleans. Many wealthy and politically connected individuals paid Laveau to aid in personal advice, intervention, and protection from evil energy. She also worked as a hairdresser, which gave her access to information regarding her clients because honestly, let's be honest, everyone's hairdresser is their therapist. Honestly, what didn't this woman do? She also ran an orphanage and helped many children have a safe home. Laveau is a popular figure in legend and lore due to her relationship to the occult, but her role in society was much larger and a little bit more scandalous than that. Number 6, Louisa Cassati. Also known as the Divine Marquise, we have yet another woman of mystery on this list. Louisa Cassati beguiled everyone she came across. She was a young, well-born heiress who married into the Lombardy aristocracy. The mundane was an insult to her. She dressed in extravagance wherever she went, dyeing her hair fiery shades, darkening her eyes with makeup and contour with coal. Her
Her guiding principle in life was to imitate art, as opposed to art imitating life. But due to her extravagant presentation, she became the muse of dozens of famous artists. Thanks to her immense fortune, she traveled the world leaving a trail of lavish parties that even Gatsby would gawk at. Every party topped the last. She had a collection of very special drugs, naked servants gilded in gold, wild animals. Her tombstone reads, age cannot wither her nor custom stale her infinite variety. Number 5. Madam CJ Walker Madam CJ Walker broke records and blasted through glass ceilings as the first self-made female person of color millionaire in America. She made her fortune thanks to her homemade line of hair care products for black women. Her parents were slaves who worked in Louisiana, but she was the first of their children to be born free after the Emancipation Proclamation. After an experience with hair loss, she created the Walker system of hair care. She had a knack for self-promotion that started by selling directly to the clients and then employed beauty culturalists to hand sell her wares. She not only continued to build her business, but she also kept a hand behind her to help lead future generations towards success. Walker used her fortune to help fund scholarships for women, donated large sums to NAACP and the Black YMCA among other charities. An absolute legacy. Number 4 Mary Wollstonecraft Mary Wollstonecraft is a feminist icon who began setting the groundwork for women's rights all the way back in the late 1700s. She authored A Vindication of Rights of Women in 1792, which is considered the earliest treatise advocating for women's rights. Wollstonecraft was born in the age of the Enlightenment in England. The Enlightenment is pretty much as it sounds, an intellectual period which advocated for reason to obtain objective truths. As part of this movement, Mary and her sister founded a girls school in London in 1789 to educate young girls. She continued to write articles advocating for the education and equality of women in society throughout her life. She believed that if women weren't educated to the same degree as men were, then society would come to a standstill. Sadly, Mary never fully saw the success of her ideas. She died during the birth of her second daughter, Mary, who, funny enough, would go on to write one of the most controversial books in history, Frankenstein. Number 3. The Marquis de Sade Ooh, we're getting spicy. This man was so wild that people are startled to learn that he was actually real. He is the founder of the term sadism, which should say a lot about him. And he was known for his scandalous and erotic texts that the public hungered for. Donatien Alphonse Francois Marquis de Sade lived from 1740 to 1814 and died in a mental asylum. His works were banned in France all the way up till 1957. Even his very name was scrubbed from the family legacy. Descendants, along with a very interesting historian found his work bricked up behind a wall in the attic of Condé Castle. The erotica he wrote is even too extreme by today's standards. He literally held nothing back. To people who admire him, his novels are about exploring the dark hidden impulses of human nature. Saad fought hard against the civilized restraints on behavior imposed on the state, while others interpret his work as a justification for all the awful crimes he committed. 120 Days in Sodom is his most famous work, which he wrote while imprisoned in the Bastille before being let out during the revolution. Many look back upon him today as a philosopher who challenged control and ideas, all while still making any new reader blush. Number 2. Anne Boleyn this was considered one of the biggest scandals ever, this entire marriage. King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn were married. Anne was his second wife, and she was crowned queen in 1533, but only three years later, in 1536, she was charged with adultery, conspiracy against the king, and incest. Even worse, she was found guilty. And come May 19th, 1536, she had her head taken off at Tower Green. Cut to today, was Anne Boleyn falsely accused? What do we know? Well, many believe that King Henry issued these charges in order to get Anne just out of the picture. She didn't produce a male heir, and right after she was executed, King Henry married his third wife, Jane Seymour, with the main goal in mind to have a son. Now, originally, Anne was a member of Henry's court. She was a maid of honor to Catherine, his first wife. And in a typical kingly fashion, he tried to sleep around with her, but she wasn't into him initially. Now, when they did get married, it was quite the task. Divorce was a no-go under the Catholic Church, so Henry argued that Anne had previously married his brother Arthur. He argued that the Pope wrongfully granted that marriage, so he found a Pope loophole. Wild. And of course at number one we have Giacomo Casanova. This man left behind his colorful life story wrapped within the pages of an erotic memoir. It was so scandalous that even the censored version was put on the Vatican's list of prohibited books. But in 2011 his scandalous pages were put on display making the public blush. But it wasn't just his tales of sex and love that would shock you, but the sheer craziness of the life he lived. He lived from 1725 to 1798 and was the son of an actress. In film adaptations with David Tennant and 
Heath Ledger, he is depicted as an all out playboy with unwavering charm. But he was also a true enlightened polymath. Voltaire, Catherine the Great, Benjamin Franklin, and Mozart all hung out with this dude. He was a gambler, an astrologer, a spy, a traveler, wrote a proto feminist pamphlet, and a science fiction novel. He basically invented the lottery, saved a man who was being accidentally killed by his doctors, he fluctuated from penniless to extremely rich to penniless at the end of his life, and wrote his memoir while working as a librarian of all things. In and amongst his adventures were over 120 notorious love affairs with countesses, milkmaids, and even nuns. Sword fights, escapes, cons, arrests, the life of Casanova made for a very interesting read.